This is Robin Hardy, author of the screenplay and will direct and produce The Wrath of the Gods, the third film in the Wicker Man trilogy. And you're listening to Without Your Head. Welcome to the station of Decapitation Without Your Head. I'm Nasty Neil. And I'm Mama Creepy. Else, and we're joined by Martin Gooch, the writer and director of The Gatehouse. How you Hello. Doing? Hey. I'm cool, thanks. How's it going? Oh. Good. Hey. You know where we are. Where exactly are you? Uh, I'm right in the middle of London at the moment. London, okay. England. I'm I've in a, pl- a place called Islington. Hmm. I've never been. I'm, I'm at my friend some... Paul's house. Oh, all right. <laughs> I'm not even at home. I'm, I've, I've, I've crashed someone else's house. Uh-huh. Well, the, without your head, it's that important. Yeah. <laughs> I'm drinking PG Tips tea. Just oh, that's energy. good. All right. Yeah, well, that's good. I had Last time I went to America, I had to bring my own tea. It's oh, Lipton tea. Yeah, Lipton yeah. tea is horrible. I was I spent a few months in the hospital in rehab last year, and yeah. uh, uh, it was just Lipton tea, and it's it, it kind of tastes like green beans. Well, it's like yeah, it's tea, it's tea for um, tea for iced tea, isn't it? It's not really tea for hot tea. Yeah, it's very very bad. Yeah. So I'd have I'd have like uh, some real tea smuggled in. Yeah. Well, now you know me. I can just mail it over to you. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> My tea. I go to a specialty shop. <laughs> I'll send you a Christmas Christmas tea I'm hamper. A, I love it. I'm a big I'm a tea, tea drinker. Uh huh. <laughs> So uh, I know people were expecting just to listen to us talk about tea, but yeah. you do yeah. have a movie, <laughs> Gatehouse, and uh, if for people who haven't seen it yet, can you give them an idea of what the Gatehouse is? Uh, okay, sure. Well, the Gatehouse is a very English movie. We filmed it a, f- a couple of years ago in a place called Somerset, and it's a, a, a gothic fantasy all about a little girl called Eternity who's only 10 years old, and she lives in a haunted gatehouse at the edge of an ancient forest, and she likes to dig for buried treasure and see if she can find something, and then one day she digs up something she shouldn't, and the forest wanted back. Mm-hmm. It's, That's what it's about. And not just because you're here, but Mama Creepy and myself, uh, I've been talking about the movie uh, since we saw it a couple weeks ago, and uh, yeah. we, we both really love the movie. Oh, cool. Thank you very much. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> that makes this conversation oh, yeah. so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> right. I suppose, man, did we hate that movie. Yeah. No. <laughs> Scarlett Rayner. Oh, my God. She was so great in it. Mm-hmm. So great as Eternity. She, and what a doll. Yeah, she yes, was wonderful. When, when we filmed the film, she was only 10 years old. Uh, and her, her ability and her stagecraft and her understanding of what actually happens on a film set was absolutely fantastic. You know, I know I know actors who've been working for 20 years who don't have that level of concentration. So it was a real, it was a real pleasure to have a kid like that on set, you know, and she doesn't muck about. She just sits there and uh, le- uh, practice. Well, she doesn't even learn her lines because she learned them all. It was amazing. Her her brain is like a sponge. You just give her the script. And I, uh, when before we started shooting the film, I gave her the script. And, I, you know, I checked with her mum and everything to make sure it was okay. And, uh, and then I left her for a couple of weeks. And then I came around their house and I said, you know, you don't have to learn the whole script. You only have to learn it scene by scene the night before you're going to sc- we're going to shoot it. And she said, no, 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 I've learned the whole thing. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, I've, I've learned the whole script all the way through. And, uh, oh, wow. and I said, yeah, and I said, okay, then. So I just opened it at random, like page 42 or something. And she had learned the whole of the script. And oh, then she wow. said, and I've learned everybody else's words as well, in case they forget them. <laughs> oh, <wow. Yeah>. Pretty <laughs> amazing. It was wow. amazing. And the whole time we were filming, she never, ever had the script. It was all in her head. Like most actors have the, the, you know, the sides, dailies in their pocket. And they'll pull them out uh-huh. and check them, or, or the script supervisor will have their script. Or I, I mean, as a director, I always have the script in my hand the whole time I'm filming. And um, she never, not once ever asked for um, a, a line read or anything, you know, to, uh, a cue. She always, it was always in her brain. It was fan- fascinating. Yeah. And wow. What I like about uh, her performance and, and the character itself is uh, obviously she is very adorable and everything. Yeah. But that kind of hides, I think, uh, that she's also dangerous. The character, mm-hmm. and she kind of, you kind of, kind of overlook a lot of that because, hey, it's this cute girl. Yeah, 
I think that I, that's, I'm glad you picked up on that because I very much wanted that to be how she was because she's a, mm-hmm. a, a country girl and she effectively lives on her own. She's lost her mum. Her dad's a bit hopeless. And she spends her days wandering around in the woods experimenting and digging holes and hitting things with sticks mm-hmm. like you should do if you grew up in the countryside. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and she's totally and completely independent. And to be that independent, you've got to be strong. You can't. You can't be hopeless. Mm-hmm. She came off very powerful. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And like, the, she like I said, you know, kind of uh, dangerous as well, because uh, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. you know when she grows up, it could go uh, different ways. It could be uh, become a lot more dangerous. Yeah, I think so. And also, like with her choice of wardrobe, we gave uh, and uh, makeup. We gave her plaits at the top of her head so they looked a little bit like horns coming out of her head mm. and then of course when she meets the horned god uh later on in the film he has horns coming out of his head so i wanted her to be sort of you know a product of her environment you uh-huh. know she's reflecting what she's seeing yeah even before she's seen it mm-hmm. is it are there any real legends that this is inspired by or based on oh yeah well i mean the the original idea was i mean the horned god is an ancient uh, Celtic legend way before Christianity. I mean, this is thousands and thousands of years ago, uh, uh, before the Romans invaded Britain in uh, 50 BC. Um, there were many different religions in in the in the, in, well, in the British Isles, and uh, the Celts were there, and uh, they believed in all sorts of uh, sort of pagan gods. And you would have the horned god, who was sort of like a creature who would exist in the woods and do strange things. I don't really know uh, too much about it, but he's been around for thousands and thousands of years and he protects the wildlife and he protects the trees and he protects uh, the countryside. So that that's a, a in inverted commas, real piece mm-hmm. of uh, mythology. But the whole thing about the black flowers and the rune stones and everything, that was, you know, stuff that I added. That yeah. I don't think, I, don't, I think that came out of my head rather than any, uh, you know, real historical mythological uh uh background mm-hmm. it, that the the that uh, specific one about the the horn um being in the, in the forest is that is that something you just grew up with like that you just had like uh some base knowledge of uh well there's another guy because you know this is this is england we've got a lot of history Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, there's so many myths and legends and all sorts of things going around. A lot of them have never been filmed or anything. And there's uh, there's also Hearn the Hunter, and you've all heard of Robin Hood and the Mm -hmm. Sheriff of Nottingham. Mm -hmm. Well, at that time... Uh, they, they, Christianity was around, but they, I mean, we went on the Crusades to the Holy Lands, and uh, that was exactly the time of Robin Hood. Um, And, uh, but they also believed in other things, and one of the things they believed in was Hearn the Hunter, who was the eternal hunter, and he would constantly be going through the woods, uh, throughout the British Isles, or throughout the world, as it was, and, uh, uh, and he, he would have a, a, a helmet, and he had horns coming out of the the top of his helmet and he was a, a man but he lived in the woods and uh, he was like a mini a, a mini god and he would go and hunt stag and all that sort of stuff so that that image was from robin hood and we used to have a tv series when i was a kid called robin hood uh, um and uh, that was really fantastic um and there was a one image of this guy standing in the woods backlit with these horns coming out of his the top of his head and that very much inspired me for writing the uh, those scenes with the horn god in um, uh, Black Flower uh, in uh, the Gatehouse. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah, I um, I was actually speaking of uh, Black Flowers. I I was looking at uh, Black Flowers, and um, just, I haven't seen it, um, but I was looking at um, the description of it, and um, also of After Death and all your movies um, really have kind of a, a real central theme to it, and they really kind of encapture, like, the family dynamic. And then it seems like you kind of craft the story around that. Um, and I think you did a beautiful job with that, um, like with Gatehouse. You know, there was a great, there was a family dynamic with, um, you know, Eternity and her dad. And you know, it wasn't a traditional one. You know, there was turbulence there. The mother had passed. Her her father was, well, 
the way he was, <laughs> you yeah. know, and, um, you know, she was off doing her own thing and, um, you know, just the way she was, her character was building up, you know, resentment and fear and anger and things like that. And, uh, the way it kind of built up throughout the movie and it kind of just burst through, um, and how he was coping and dealing with the loss of his wife and raising a daughter on his own, you know, that whole family dynamic. Um, and you see that in your other movies too, that you've done, um, with like after death, there's that, you know, the family comes together mm-hmm. after the father dies, you know, and they, they have to kind of band together to, uh, try and find his, his final experiment. And yeah. now with, uh, black flowers, you've got, uh, it's a post apocalyptic, um, yeah. North America. And you've got a family once again. Um, do you find that that's, um, generally, um, I think. where your writing comes from? Uh, I think that, I mean, there's many, many answers to that, really. One of them is, of course, the films we're making have quite small budgets. And, uh, mm-hmm. and be- because of that, there's certain things you can't do. You know, you can't have uh, huge special effects and you can't have a thousand orcs uh, in a battle <laughs> and you can't have 20 <laughs> tanks, but you can have one tank. So, for example, in The Search for Simon, we've got one tank at the beginning of the film, 1943 uh, uh, Sherman tank mm-hmm. from World War Two. And there's things we can do. And, and, and part of the writing process for me is thinking, you know, first of all, we've got the story. So I think, OK, I want to do uh, a film set in the woods, blah, 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 blah. And then I'll, st- I, I, I'll literally think practically about what I can get. What can I get? What's available? What can I, what what can I use? And then once I've got a little, just you know, half a page of notes of what I can get, then I have to sort of get the story to fit around what we have. Because when we did the gatehouse, uh, what happened was that actual gatehouse is a real 17th century lodge. It's a hunting lodge just up the road from where my parents live in a little village in Somerset. And uh, yeah. I was walk- I was driving past it one day, and it had been tidied up. And there's a woman putting up laundry outside washing. And so I stopped and I said, oh, I love your house. It's brilliant. I live down the road. And she said, oh, oh, come and have a look. And so I went inside and it was just fantastic. It's, it's, it's exactly as it is in the film. You mm-hmm. know, we really didn't oh. dress it very much. We just put in a few pictures and a few bits and pieces, but that's mostly how it is. And um, uh, we, um, she, she said, what do you do? And I said, I make films. She said, oh, my God, I love films. And uh, and I said, look, if I, write, if I write a script for your house, can I come mm-hmm. and film in it? And she said, yes. And so like four or five months later, we turned up with a film crew and shot in a house. So awesome. it was it was very much the fact that that location was amazing and beautiful and that most of the forest that we filmed in is just around the back of the gatehouse. So it's all yeah. walking distance. <laughs> And, and, you know, the okay. fact that that house existed and we could film in it, that was the impetus to go and write the script. Yeah. So the, so did you have yeah. any did you have any of the idea before, like, you know, uh, some of the elements in your mind like you wanted to make? Or was it really just seeing that house that inspired you to, to, to go from there? I'd say it was 80 percent seeing the house and 20 percent. I really wanted to do something sort of vaguely gothic horror in mm-hmm. the woods. A fantasy thing i mean when i was pitching it i said have you seen pan's labyrinth uh mm. and they'll say yes and i say well this is like pan's labyrinth but without the labyrinth or pan mm-hmm. <laughs> and that seemed That's to get a, a laugh to and it seemed to work no i i no i got that feel i mean i definitely got that feel the girl going out and you know attorney going out and exploring the woods and things like that um you know it I got that feel from it's it. It's like a modern day fable. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, That's exactly what I was going for. Yeah. yeah. Which I think, I think is, uh, is that hard to pull off? Because um, if you're making a fable, <clears throat> you know, especially in modern day, there has to be at some point uh, people have to like suspend disbelief and go with certain things. So yeah. is that hard to, when you're writing and filming it to, uh, to pull off, you think, for the audience to, to be with it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I didn't I didn't want to do a horror horror and I, I'm not I love horror films, but I prefer the sort of uh, supernatural werewolves and mummies and vampires rather than slasher films. That's just my personal take. 
So I, and you know, I've totally the totally valid genre, um, and I, so I wanted to do something that was more supernatural and weird and ghostly than uh, a killer's loose in the woods. Uh, yeah. Because I think I think other people do that, and other people have done it better. So I wanted to sort of do something, and I don't think anyone's done a film uh, a, about a little girl who goes wandering, digging for buried treasure in the woods, and discovers this ancient creature. I don't think, as far as I know, that film exists. So I wanted to do. I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> no, good, good. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> so, uh, so I wanted to do something unlike anybody else has done, and then do it in a in a unique way. So it's about a, about a, a sort of failed family unit. Uh, who come together to fight the forces of evil, but the forces of evil are actually their next door neighbour. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Rather, because you know, because like at the beginning of the film, it says, um, based on a true story, there are monsters in the woods. Well, there are monsters in the woods. Unfortunately, they're people, mm-hmm. and that's that's sort of the point of the story. And and the, the horned god is a monster, but he's not the monster. Yeah. The monster is the yeah. next door neighbour. Mm-hmm. And I may have like this spoiler alert, a bit late, but spoiler alert. <laughs> oh. don't, don't watch, don't listen to what I'm saying. Yes. Delete. <laughs> cover your ears, cover your ears. That's it, that's it. I've yeah. given the game away. Oops. Yeah. Uh, how about casting him in particular, that character? Because uh, uh, I think well, he also Lion- nails him. Yeah, Lionel's brilliant. I mean, I've made a lot of films, but my very first proper short film uh, was called The Orgasm Ray Gun way back in 1998 <laughs> which is an amazing it's on, name, it's on youtube somewhere uh, just just check it out i i have i saw that on your filmography and i was like yeah. <laughs> it instantly reminded me of the movie uh there's a movie called orgasmo yeah but ours was and, first <laughs> we, we made our film before before <laughs> orgasmo so yeah. we obviously totally stole it from us now, now yeah. going off your previous statement about uh, making yeah. a film on things you have, now, did you happen yeah. to have an orgasm ray gun? Well, it's like, funny you should say that, too. because the, the orgasm ray gun in the film, I mean, it's only a short, it's, two, it's three and a half minutes long. Mm-hmm. The orgasm ray gun in the film was just made from the stuff that was in uh, the garden shed. So, yes, we did have an <laughs> orgasm ray gun in our house. Uh-huh. And, uh, and the, 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 in the story, the guy invents an orgasm ray gun, but he wants to develop it, so he goes to the bank for a loan. And the actor we cast as the banker was Lionel Haft back in 1998 when we made the film. And so he was like the first actor who was ever in one of my films. Uh, so that's fantastic. And we always got on very well. And he's a, he's a brilliant, brilliant chap. And so every, every time I've done something, I've tried to get Lionel back on set. So he's in After Death uh, and uh, he's in um, uh, The Gatehouse. And I'm sure we'll work on other things in the future together as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was great. He he came off very creepy. Yeah, yeah, he's good at creepy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's good, good at creepy. creepy. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I like it because at the same time you can just see him and think, oh, this is just you know an old an old uh, a guy out in the woods. Weird you know, walking around. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I before I forget, do I have to ask? Uh, because you said you you know about having uh, using things you you have. Well, who had a tank? Who had a tank? Yeah. Oh, well. Because uh, I, you know, I know a lot of people, <laughs> and uh, and I said that I put, I think I put on Facebook, uh, uh, this, you know, we, we did search time a couple of years ago, and I put on Facebook. I said, I need a tank. Who can get me a tank? Uh, and then a about, tank? well, yeah, that's it. And about twenty four hours later, one of my friends emailed me to say, I've got a friend uh, who's got a tank, but I've got to be in the film if you let me, if if I'm going to give you the contacts. So I said, yeah, of course, of course. So he's he's the guy who shoots me in the film. He's the plays the German who's not a German. Uh huh. So he got his cameo, and we got a tank. So uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah. Where, uh, hey, that's, where, that's worth it. Yeah, where, where does one get like a the, own a tank? Uh, well, he he had he it's down it's down. Uh, you, I mean, you won't know where this is, but it's the junction of the M5 and the M4 in England, which is to the west, uh, near on the way to Wales. And uh, he owns a farm, and so he's got a lot of space. And his hobby is repairing World War II uh, stuff. So he had a Mack truck, a tank, uh, a couple of jeeps, this very strange German anti-aircraft thing, and some other vehicles, all all gently rusting in his garden. And he, <laughs> and he built, yeah. But the one, but some of them, like the Mack truck and the and the Sherman tank, all work, you know. And he's oh, built wow. them himself, you know. They the, the Sherman tank was a uh, was a British Army uh, 
shooting on a shooting range they're using it for target practice for like 10 years mm-hmm. and uh, then he, he saw it and he bought it and then he put it back to life that's pretty awesome wow yeah it was it was totally <laughs> awesome and the sound it makes when it's driving along it i mean it weighs like 30 tons or whatever it yeah. makes so much noise uh, you couldn't really hear yourself thinking uh, <laughs> and uh, we we had all these other scenes this is for search for simon of course mm-hmm. and uh, we had all these other scenes planned with dialogue but when we got there it was so difficult to record sound and um do that that we had to uh we had to abandon those scenes and it was so cold it was like three degrees centigrade i don't know what that is fahrenheit but it's bloody cold uh-huh. and um uh we were freezing to death and the, the tank is made out of iron and we're all sitting on top of the tank and you can feel it uh-huh. sucking the heat out of you like you're sitting on an ice cube <laughs> And then I just, everyone just brains froze and they couldn't remember their lines. So we cut a whole scene because no one could remember anything and everyone was too cold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, act, how about what goes into actually creating uh, the woods uh, spirit monster in Gatehouse? Yeah, well, I was very lucky because I met these brilliant art department girls uh, in McCook and Charlotte Ball who were very talented. They did everything. Uh, they made the whole creature. And uh, he's, he's a complete bodysuit. And the whole bodysuit is completely covered uh, in sort of expanded foam, which uh, in my hand carved uh, the bark onto the whole thing, which must have taken a days and days and days. Wow. And then he, we gave him a cloak so he had less of a shape, uh, less of a human shape. And the cloak mm. had real leaves hand stitched onto the cloak. And then the, the whole oh. helmet, she, uh, she created herself from some sort of expanded polystyrene and it's painted on top and carved. And then the antlers are actual antlers from uh, the front antlers are from an African antelope uh, that we had sent over. And the antlers on the top uh, are from a Scottish stag. So uh, it's a very international uh, horned god, all the way from Africa and all the way from Scotland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And who was the actor that um, was the horned god in this? Uh, we get well. The horn god, funnily enough, is is mostly played by a chap called Tom Green. Very nice, uh, very very slim because he could fit inside the costume. Because the costume, yeah. you know, had to be really really slim mm. to fit inside. Because I, I didn't think the horn god would be too chubby, you know, because he grew up <laughs> grew up from a tree. There's not a lot of fat on a tree, oh. and. Uh, and then, of course, unfortunately, Tom was not available every single day because he's doing other things. So the horn god in one scene is actually played by the dad. Uh, by by um, Simeon, Simon. and then in, in the scene, yeah, the scene where Scarlet comes into her bedroom and discovers the Horn God in her bedroom and screams and hits it with her spade. The the actor inside the Horn God is actually Scarlet's real dad <laughs> in that scene. So she's hitting her real dad with a spade, which we thought was quite funny. Yeah, yeah. But mostly it's Tom. Mostly right. the Horn God is Tom. She's giving out some uh, some pen up aggression. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yes. <laughs> I'm always really interested in, um, like, who's actually playing those characters inside yeah. the massive um, costumes or the builds like that. Because as an actor, you have to act through that whole costume, you know, yeah. and, and that's a lot to work with. So, um, and I, I loved that. Um, yeah, it's tricky. And also the way the yeah. way we design the Horn Gods, uh, face is he it actually changes a few times in the film if you watch it really clear carefully you'll see his, his the front of his face is not always the same it's different mm-hmm. and uh there are no eye holes at all so whenever the actor is in the horn god costume he cannot see anything at all there's absolutely nothing he can see except possibly his chin and down <laughs> down the bottom of the front of his shirt uh so when we're when he's on set we have to direct him to shout at him so we say, Tom, Tom, forwards, forwards, left a bit, left a bit, left, right, right. Tom, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> and, uh, and then some, one time we thought we could, we could hold his hand and, and have the hand going off the edge of the screen, but it looked terrible. And then one time we thought we could poke him with a stick, like you know, herding, herding a cattle, but that looked terrible as well. So in the end, we just discovered the only way to do it was to shout at him and, yeah. uh, and tell him what to do. Yeah. That's, Which that's is generally why he's walking so slowly because he's scared he's going to fall into a hole. <laughs> but works for me. Yeah, that's funny because when I interviewed the the Cenobites from uh, from Hellraiser, yes. uh, the ones that played uh, Chatterer and uh, and Butterball, yes. uh, Simon Bamford and um, Nicholas Vince, it was the same way. They couldn't see anything, 
And they just had to tell him, like, you know, move two steps forward and then, like, one to the right. Yeah, that's exactly it. (laughs) Because we thought about eye holes, but quite often it just looks like the human underneath. Or if we put lights in, I'd thought, well, what's the light source? And in the end, it just came that we decided he he was a a more of a faceless being. Mm -hmm. That totally works. Yeah, cool. And what else really works, I think, is, um, again, kind of a spoiler, is when you see a woman, like, uh, being absorbed by the tree, like, becoming part of the tree. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I loved that. That looked great. Yeah. That was that was a cold, cold February day. And uh, poor old Samantha, who plays the girl who gets, who becomes the tree, uh, we, we had lots of ideas of how to do it. But the problem was there's nothing we could do to stop her being cold. And, uh, you know, because mm-hmm. we were outside for so long, even if we'd bought a hot water bottle, it would have been freezing cold by then. And just <laughs> sitting on the ground, the, the ground is sort of sucking the heat out of her constantly all day. Uh, that was that was uh, difficult for her. But I think she did a great job. And half of that is real. Uh, so her, most of her makeup is real. And there's lots of things around her that are real. And then the rest of it was finished off uh, by my friend Kenny, uh, who did all the, the CGI and created the sort of uh, the chest sort of skeletal tree cavity into which she's sitting. He created all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it works. It's also pretty creepy to think about, you know, uh, being absorbed into a tree. Yeah. Well, we all get absorbed into trees at some point. That's very true. Ultimately. I have a tree in my front yard. I go out and hug. I totally go out and hug my tree in my front yard. I do. It kind of centers me. It centers me and locks me down. I love that tree. I, I won't yeah. say what I do with my tree, but it does have no, a very sure. nice. Yeah, but it helps we all know nice what you do with. Yeah. We know what you do with that tree, there, Neil. Yeah, we okay. all know what you do with that tree. Oh, that's that's why you have so many saplings. So. <laughs> that's why I noticed actually about eternity being uh, yeah. how how she's uh, dangerous. There's danger to her, but then she's uh, kind of clouded in in being innocent, which I've always been told I'm a very creepy guy, but yet. I'm kind of silly and stuff, so it hides uh, the creepiness. <laughs> yes, of so course. I could definitely That's the best way to be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is there any of the characters that um, that have a a bit of you in them? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I think I think Eternity has a bit of me uh, from like when I was a kid. I mean, I used to love wandering around the woods, uh, and you know, I grew up, grew up in quite a small town, and I love being outside and and filming the film. Uh, it was great because we were out. I mean, it was cold. Yes, it was cold. And everyone complained about the cold. But it was really wonderful to be outside every day. And uh, uh, one day, Mark Hammond and I, he's the DOP, uh, we turned up early and no one else was there. We turned up before the sun came up. And then the, we were setting up the camera and the sun arose and everything went gold because overnight everything had frozen and the sun comes up and it's yellow and it just hit the grass and the grass was no longer yellow, uh, uh, green. It was golden. So we broke out all the cameras. We put out four cameras. We're doing time lapses and and filming everything. And most of those shots are in the film of this beautiful golden morning. And it lasted for about, I don't know, 10 minutes before the sun had had melted off a lot of the ice and it had had risen so high. Uh, So that was that was a happy accident. We just happened to be there at the right second. And we got all those shots and all that golden those shots in throughout the film come from one moment. Mm. Uh, but but who's me? I don't. I think I don't. I think there's a little bit of me in every character because obviously I'm writing the dialogue, sure. and you're trying to give everyone their own individual voice. But it all comes from one brain, uh, and then I let the actors take over, and I say, you know, I want you to own it. So change the dialogue to to fit how you'd say it. And uh, Scarlett changed quite a few words so they were more ten year old girl rather than forty year old man uh, to make it more appropriate. <laughs> Uh, but other than, other than that, uh, I, I sort of, I, I think, I don't think there's that much of me in this film. In other films, there's much more of me, obviously, but um, but this film's more of a departure, yeah. Yeah. Is, um, is this a, are your, has your other movies been um, released in the States, or are they mostly in Europe? Yeah, no, uh, After Death, which is my first film, that's on iTunes and Amazon and the usual places uh, uh, in North America, and... Um, my second film, The Search for Simon, that's also iTunes, Amazon, you know, uh, usual places. It's also on Steam uh, for mm. gamers. Uh, really? It's, it's a great great platform. Yeah, it's good fun. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and then the new one, which we've, we've only just finished shooting. We shot it in North California in Mount Shasta and in Montana. Uh, we mm. only finished shooting that a month ago. 
uh, that's called Black Flowers, and that's the post-apocalyptic one, and that was great fun. And that will be out uh, towards the end of next year, I hope. Cool. I, I like that that phrase there. It's a post-apocalyptic one. It's great yeah, fun. It's it. it's yeah. A... yeah. <laughs> apocalyptic yeah. North yeah. America. It's great fun. Uh, yeah. But uh, again, not just because you're here, but I I really love Gatehouse, and I look forward to uh, checking out your other movies. So I like to see cool. other stuff you've done. Yeah, so, no, I think I tried to keep the theme, you know, like because when I made that when I made the first film, you know, once again we didn't have very much money, so you got to be creative uh, with your script. And I tried to do a film unlike anybody else's. Um, so we did a mysterious comedy sci-fi drama, uh, which may be too complicated for uh, for the uh, the shops, the sales agents. But so really, we just pitched it as a mystery. And um, uh, when when we did that we got a review in a British newspaper that said Martin had invented his own genre and they called it kitchen sink weirdness. And I really liked that. And I thought, I, I like that. I've got my own genre. Let's, uh, yeah. let's own it. So all the other films, uh, the gatehouse, uh, search for Simon and now black flowers, they're all in that same genre of kitchen sink weirdness. So mm -hmm. they all, they all could take place in the same world at like a that. similar time. Obviously the, the black flowers, uh, film, is set ever so slightly in the future, set two years in the mm -hmm. future. Uh, but a gatehouse could happen now, and Search Simon's set now, and After Death is set now. Yeah. Well, along those lines, what kind of movies uh, were you interested in? Oh, I, I like anything weird. Uh -huh. Anything weird. So all the fantasy films, all the sci-fi films, anything with people hacking each other to death with swords, uh, that's always good. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the greatest films I saw when I was a kid was Dragon Slayer. Mm -hmm. which came right. out in, a, yeah. in about 1982 and was just mm -hmm. totally blew me away. Uh, I mean, I think I saw it about five years ago and I thought it wasn't, it hadn't aged quite so well. I in my head, that. it was fantastic. Because that's one of my brother's favorite, my older brother's uh, favorite films. Yeah, and, it had one uh, of the I best agree posters that. ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was totally brilliant. And I saw it when I was about eight or nine or ten or something. And it just blew me away. You know, when you see the dragon vermin thrax, Yes. Arrive out of the water behind him. You just—that's the first time you've ever seen a dragon. It mm -hmm. was just wonderful, and uh, 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 and many films like that, you know, and also also uh, you know the classics like Star Wars. I remember seeing that in the cinema, and uh, uh, mm -hmm. Terry Gilliam, Jabberwocky I, was a huge influence. Yeah, Time Bandits, you know. Mm -hmm. Love Terry Gilliam. Weird, I was yeah, I was actually going to bring up Gilliam because I, I could, I could actually see Gatehouse, sort of a film that uh, that Gilliam would have made. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very it's happy to hear that. I don't want to say, like, you know. Yeah, he lives up the road from me, so when we get a DVD, I'll pop it through his letterbox. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That would be so wonderful. Oh, yeah, Terry Gilliam just lives right up the street from me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yes, yeah. this is London, you know. Everybody lives here. Yeah, you guys all live right next to each other. Yeah. 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 I don't know if you ever see Tideland, even though it's a much different movie, but uh, yeah. just kind of, uh, I think the theme with the girl is, uh, yeah. is similar in a way. Yeah, Tideland's very beautiful. Very beautiful. It's difficult watch, but yeah. it's very beautiful. Yeah, some great performances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I'm excited about the man who uh, who uh, killed Bob Quixote finally coming out. Yeah, that. I mean, what an epic journey yeah. to make that film. I mean, they've already made one film about making the film Lost yeah. in a Man Show. Mm -hmm. They should now make another film about making the film. <laughs> I know. Oh. They can make a sequel. Yeah, a sequel, but... yeah, to the to the makings of uh, that movie's like. You at the beginning, it's like, oh, you're so excited. You could see how how, how much love he has, you know, for this yes. making this movie. And then it's just, it's really just uh, uh, the shattering movie, just to see everything fall apart. Oh, it's heartbreaking, and everyone's working so hard, mm -hmm. and the poor old first AD is having such a nightmare, and they just they just were beset with problems, you know, things that are out of their control, like flash floods, and the actor getting sick, and all these sorts of things. You know, they're beyond their control. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the filmmaker's fault. It was you know, the the great gods of film decided they didn't want this film to be made. Mm -hmm. Yet. Yet. So, Yet. Exactly. Yet. So, yeah. so uh, have you have you shown the gatehouse at, at, at festivals or any screenings or anything? Yeah, we ha we've had a great festival run. It's pretty much over now. Uh, we did uh, we won Best Film at the London Independent Film Festival oh, earlier nice. this year uh, in April. And then we played uh, at the Iowa uh, independent film festival won best film there that was fantastic uh, and uh, we've played at quite a few festivals across America 
uh, the Fargo Film Festival up in North Dakota, which I couldn't get to, unfortunately, uh, and also oh, Buffalo Dreams. Was there a blizzard uh, there? No, I just I just couldn't get there. It was too far. It was like <laughs> it, was, it was like four days away in travel time, so yeah. I couldn't get there. Um, and uh, we also played in Long Beach, uh, and then we've played in Finland, uh, and a whole load of festivals in the UK, and we also played uh, somewhere else. I've forgotten now. My poor old brain. Uh, but we did about 20, 20 festivals and we won a whole load of awards and nominations. So that was pretty good for yeah. a tiny, yeah. tiny little film. Yeah. yeah. You said to played uh, Buffalo Dreams? The That's fantastic. right. Just, oh, cool. just like last week or a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I almost uh, was invited to uh, to cover that, yeah. but um, yeah. it was kind of between doing a bunch of other things. But oh, we had yeah. the, the promoter of that on, on the show uh, earlier in the year. Yeah, no, it looks like a fantastic festival. And they played The Search for Simon a couple of years ago and we got nominated for a whole load of awards. So that was a real shame I couldn't get there. But um, yeah. you can only go to so many festivals, unfortunately. Sure. unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. So the ones you were at, what's it like to watch your own film with an audience? Uh, well, that's one of the greatest things, isn't it? Uh, because we, we uh, opened at the Rain Dance Film Festival in London and uh, they, we completely sold out, so they had to book another screening for us, which also sold out. So that was really lovely. Uh, and I was, I always, I always sit in the audience and I listen to the audience because you know the film. I've, I've seen the film, you know, a hundred times, and uh, you just want to listen to the audience. And because the gatehouse does have some comedic beats in it. I'm waiting for the audience to laugh at those moments. <laughs> and it's always fascinating because a different audience will laugh at different places. And uh, if there's there's a moment, uh, spoiler alert, where Eternity gets electrocuted, uh, which is <laughs> it's supposed to be funny. Right, and right. some audiences laugh a lot and some audiences don't laugh at all. And some audiences say, oh, well, that wasn't very funny. This is a horror film. There shouldn't be any jokes in it. <laughs> well, I mean, try telling that to Sam Raimi, but there you go. Exactly. And, <laughs> exactly and uh, or or um uh, john carpenter and uh uh and then you go into another cinema different audience maybe a different country and they will laugh at something you didn't even know was funny mm. so there'll be something happening in the film and everyone will fall about laughing and i'll go what why is that funny oh yes <laughs> we, we we showed it in poland we showed it at the poznan uh at the uh, Piercon international fantasy festival and um the, the, it was a great audience. I mean, it was a huge audience, like 400 people, and they all laughed at different places. It was very odd. And the bit that uh, I thought was funniest, nothing, no laughter at all. And then a bit that I didn't even know was funny. Everyone was falling about killing themselves laughing. So uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's very, very strange. But it's good fun. It's good fun to watch, uh, to watch a film with an audience. I mean, I would never, now the film's complete. I will never sit down and watch the film again unless there's other people there. Listen, I have no e interest in watching it again. Yeah. Uh, when you watch your own movie, I guess with the with the audience there, it's it's a different experience. Yeah. But otherwise, uh, do you see it as like a movie or more of like uh, your experience making it? The, just the technical sides. Uh, it's it's funny because I I really once I finished editing them, I really don't watch them again. That's it. Right. And because uh, I've sort of, you know, I know how it ends and, and you know, <laughs> you're always hypercritical of your own work mm -hmm. and all you ever look at is you see the errors and you look at it and you go, oh, look at that. That's that's I don't I know. Done that different. I, yeah. yeah, I could have done it better or that day it was raining or that day I was really hungry and I didn't, hadn't had any food <laughs> and I was really fed mm -hmm. up or, or that day was really wonderful. And I had a lovely day. Uh, or you, or you look at the actor and you think, oh man, I should have got them to stand just to the left or just to the right, or they should we should have put them on an apple box or, or anything. Uh, you, all you do is look at that. It's like uh, I did my degree was in fine art, and I remember someone saying to me, "Is you know, do you ever finish a painting?" And the 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 answer is no. You never ever a painting is never finished. You just become more interested in the next project. Mm -hmm. And that's and I think that's true with films because a lot of films uh, are finished because they ran out of time and they ran out of money and they had to deliver it on the 1st of December or whatever. So it had to be finished by that date. And had they have had another six months or another six thousand pounds or six million pounds, the film would be different, possibly better, but different. And I think that's true, especially of the lower budget films. Your film's finished when you when you have not lost interest in it, but you are more interested in the next project or you've run out of money. So, uh, so by the time you get to the end of your project, you have really, in a way, uh, lost interest in it. Not in yeah. a bad way, but just in a, it's time to move on. You know, you've got mm -hmm. to get to the next one. Otherwise, you'll spend your whole life trying to finish one picture. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I, I agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. And we are definitely our own worst critics. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I hate that. I hate that. I don't, I don't, I made a movie, but I hate that at my own, uh, uh, any kind of video with me. And I hate that. It, I just yeah. would just cut myself all out of it. But the, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, what I want to ask was, uh, cause this comes up a lot in the show. Cause sometimes I get aggravated about people who, uh, are so nitpicky about what genre movies in. Yes. Uh, oh, it's I don't see what the, Yeah. Yeah. It's just, what different, like, uh, alien, for example, does it matter if it's a horror movie or a science fiction movie? Does it make no. like you enjoy it any less, you know, one way or yes. the other? Or I think if, I think the answer is: is it good? Is it interesting? Exactly. That's it. That's all that matters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. uh, like Robert Robert Altman, uh, people were talking to him about three act structure and saying, "Blah blah, blah your movies, Mash doesn't have three acts." And he says, "I don't care. The only important thing is 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 it interesting? Is mm-hmm. each scene interesting enough for you to keep watching it? And you watch Mash and you go, yeah, it's brilliant. I want to watch that all the way through. And mm-hmm. then I want to have eleven years of a TV series. <laughs> right. So uh, so yes, clearly it's interesting. Yeah, I think and, it's and a, I, the test of time, yeah, right?" Exactly, and the sales agents, it's so funny because they say, well, is it a is it a horror, is it a fantasy, is it a sci-fi? And they have their, their blocks, like when you go on the airplane, it says, do you want a rom-com, do you want comedy, do you want action, do you want sci-fi, yeah. do you want fantasy, all those genres. And I'm saying, why don't we have another genre which is just weird? Yeah, and you can just have weird films, uh, and I always think it's funny, yeah. especially because I, 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 you know, I'm a big fan of America. I've travelled in America extensively, and you go into the shops there, and they have uh, a section that says international films, mm-hmm. or or world <laughs> cinema, right. which always makes me laugh because you've got the USA, and then you've got everywhere else in the entire world, <laughs> yeah, and uh, including and, Canada, yeah, and international England. includes Canada, and England. Yeah, yeah, and England, yeah. yeah, and somehow uh, that's a genre yeah. of movies. I think that's really yeah. funny. <laughs> so, so why not? Why not have weird? And then you can have all these strange films like like the Goonies. What's that? It's just a weird film, you know. Monster Squad yeah. is not is a horror, but it's not really scary, mm-hmm. but it's brilliant. I know. And I think uh, let's let's vote for the weird well, as a when, genre. I agree. We were talking about Gremlins. I mean, you look at yeah. Gremlins. Okay, is it a children's story? Is it a horror movie? Is it a Christmas story? You know, yeah. where are you going to put that? I think we should just. I mean, we could have weird. We could have a category just called other. You know, we could get real <laughs> basic with it. Just have other. You know. Yes. <laughs> I mean, just recently, what brought up is I see a lot of people in the horror community kind of like turn on it because it was a big hit, and then yeah. uh, which kind of happens a lot. And then a lot of the places, it's not a horror movie. They're like, it's a coming of age film. And and I was like, well, I guess in a way, but, uh, you know, like the Wonder Years didn't have a clown eating little kids in it. So it's not exactly, <laughs> you know, it's also a horror movie. <laughs> Did it not? I'm sure I remember that episode. Yeah. What about, yeah, when uh, Wendy Cooper gets eaten by the clown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm, so I'm voting for weird as a genre all on its own. And then yeah. you can, all the films that you don't know what they are, they go into weird. <laughs> but you know, it's yeah. like sometimes you go to places and they'll have independent films as a genre on its own. Mm-hmm. But I don't. I, don't, I, th- I always think, mm, what does that mean? Right. Does that, yeah. yeah, that'd be just like Hollywood movies as its own genre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it comes. Uh, the Gatehouse comes out uh, the fifth on video yes, demand so. from court. Uh, that's my yeah. information. Yeah, and I think so, that's right. Yeah. How important is video on demand to uh, independent directors? Oh, crikey. Well, uh, I mean, any distribution is important now. I mean, people keep saying DVD is going away, but they're still selling a billion DVDs every year. So that hasn't <laughs> gone yet. Uh, and I think right. everyone's always going to want to have DVDs because if you want to buy someone something for a birthday present, you don't just want to give them a little piece of paper yeah, like with a code, code on it. <laughs> right. yeah, you want to give Here's them a code. A- Happy birthday. <laughs> yeah, here you go. Here's a bit of paper scribbled on. Mm-hmm. Um I mean, and things. I like the uh, like. I bought all the Lord of the Rings extended super I, duper I deluxe director's cut. Uh-huh. I got all those on DVD and and Band of Brothers on DVD. All these things are fantastic in a nice box set. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think DVD is going to go go mm-hmm. away. But a streaming is the future. You know, at some point, everybody's going to watch everything on their iPhone and their laptop streamed via Netflix or whoever, Amazon, etc. Uh, so getting our films onto those VOD platforms is incredibly important. But the most important thing, of course, is actually getting the money back. So mm-hmm. making sure that the, those films get watched 
and uh, uh, and not pirated too badly because you can't stop the pirates. But we just we just want people to understand that if you watch our films for free, then we don't make any money, and then one day we won't be able to make another film. Yeah, and uh, and you know go you know if you're going to pirate a film, please pirate Guardians of the Galaxy and not my film. Because mm-hmm. they got less money than I have. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's you know seriously, you know that's a real. Pro- and I think a lot of people that I see like online and stuff, um, I don't think they see it as even wrong at all. It's, no, uh, it's just like it's it's a cheaper way of getting a movie. Yes, you know, that, that mindset's very. Uh, it's just very odd to me. I can't wrap my head around it. But yeah, it's no, just a this, this idea that content should be free. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there should be freedom of content. Yes, that you can actually, with the internet, you can watch whatever you want to watch within sure. you know moral reasons and everything. Uh, but the, the, the creators have to be paid at some point, and if we're not paid, we 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 can't do it. Uh, we have to go and do something else. You know, like I don't know, go and be a tree surgeon or something, which isn't good for cinema <laughs> no. or trees. Yeah. yeah, I remember a few years I'm ago when Turbo being accountants. <laughs> yes, exactly. I remember a few yeah. years ago when when Turbo Kid came out, it was. Yes. Uh, it was the number one most uh, pirated film of that, and it was, it was above like um, Jurassic World and like yes. uh, Terminator really? Genesis and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but that's wow. funny, isn't it? because <laughs> people, I've I've met people who've come up to me and said, "Hey, Martin, I really loved your film," and I said, "Oh, what was that?" And they said, "Oh, I watched it on Pirate Bay," and I was like, "Well, thank you so much. That's really great. I really appreciate it." Cheers. Uh, <laughs> Give me five dollars. Uh, yeah, the, <laughs> it, we, yeah. I started the show in 2006 and one of the first guests we had on the show was Adam Green and he's yeah. talked about that was he was putting out Hatchet at the time before it came was like I yeah. think released in theaters and he talked about people was on MySpace like would message him on MySpace and say like they downloaded the movie and he'd be like you know like well could you at least go buy a ticket on like Fandango or whatever it was at the time yeah. And like they would like call him greedy and like and, and get mad. It was very it's very weird. Like the they yes. couldn't understand why he was upset like that they would, you know, just download his movie. Yeah. Well I, I felt like you know, the simple answer to that is I should phone up these people who, who work, speak to their boss and say, <laughs> Could you just deduct an hour from their from their paycheck, please? Uh-huh. You know, I don't want it. I don't want the money. Just <laughs> just deduct it from them so they can't have it. Because that's exactly the yeah. same thing. Yeah, but I mean, and the reality is, you know, if they watch a movie for, shall we say, one dollar ninety nine on iTunes, sure. If I'm lucky, I'll get ten cents of that, Mm -hmm. or even Mm -hmm. less. I mean, invariably, I'll probably get nothing. But uh, so it's we're really dealing with very very small amounts of money. And then if you see that your film has been watched forty five thousand times on uh, Pirate Bay, you think, blimey, I could have made five hundred dollars. Right. And yeah. uh, or five thousand dollars or five fifty billion dollars. I don't know, mm-hmm. but uh, but it's it, it does it does hurt. Uh, yeah. And uh, and you know we're talking about very small sums of money that uh, we have to raise to make these films, and it's hard work. And a film is a film is two years work minimum. Uh, the Gatehouse we shot in twenty fourteen, so that ended up being three years work because uh, uh, we were a long time in post production for various reasons because we had didn't have very much money. And uh, these mm-hmm. things take time. So when we actually get to release the film, it's very important that uh, that you know people watch it for real and don't 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 go to Pirate Bay. Because also remember, remember, kiddies, if you go to Pirate Bay, you go to hell when you die. <laughs> you burn for all eternity, and devils will stick pins up your bottom because you went to Pirate Bay. So don't do it. Exactly. That's uh, I'll be your well, tagline. Uh, <laughs> will there be a uh, Every DVD? Every time you go to Pirate Bay, you go to hell. I like that. Like put it right from the site. Uh, yeah. Will there be a DVD Blu-ray release of uh, The Gatehouse? Yes, it's uh, it's coming out on DVD and I think Blu-ray. Not 100% sure about DVD for sure. Uh, in the third, uh, in the end of the first quarter, so January, February, March, round about March. Oh, nice. In North America. We haven't, we're, we're just working on our UK distribution at the moment. But yeah. uh, North America sorted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Another thing about yeah, love- for me personally, I, I, oh. I love to listen to commentary tracks. That's why I like yeah. to buy DVDs or Blu-rays of, of movies. Yeah. I, I really even movies I don't think sometimes of the commentary track either makes you appreciate it more or it could just be entertaining in its own right. Well, I, I uh, that we have got a, a commentary on the gatehouse. But my most favourite commentary I ever did was on the search for Simon, my previous film. And the commentary is by me, my mum and my dad. And uh, you can hear oh my, my mum drinking tea in the background. And every now and then you can hear that little, hang on, 
Hang on. <coughs> Clink. Oh, I can't do it. It won't make a sound. <laughs> Clink of the, of the teacup in the background of my mum drinking tea. And that was lots of fun. <laughs> we laughed a lot doing that. Yeah, um, I've always, you know, even with streaming, I mean, I stream all the time, but I love having a copy of a movie, you know, yeah. um, I mean, plus, I mean, you know, weird, I, I watch some weird movies yeah. and I watch some weird movies that you can't stream. You, they just don't, you just can't, <laughs> they're yeah. not out there, you know, and I, I like having those copies, you know, so I can yeah. watch them whenever I want and I don't have to worry about trying to hunt them down. So I'm, I'm glad that I can still do that and, you know, I, be really sad if that goes away so yeah. and, but, I, I, but, and I, that, I, you yeah. can't really watch extras like there's no yeah. you know i want to see those extras I yeah, I don't understand why when they they have film streamed, they don't have a little section at the end of it with uh, additional stuff. I don't understand it because yeah. I'd like to watch the behind the scenes. Me too. Features and occasionally oh, deleted scenes, you know, mm -hmm. and they just they yeah. just re re released um, the good, the bad, and the ugly a few years ago with some deleted scenes mm -hmm. put back yep. into the film. That was great. Yeah, it was fantastic. It was super amazing, and uh, and. You know, if you don't know those steady scenes are there, then you don't know they're there. So I think that's another another what good one for DVDs, and also you get to look at the artwork on the picture of the DVD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I got two copies, yeah. two copies of that. <coughs> there were like I believe two different cases that came out with that yeah. release, and I got both of them. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, and no, that's cool. I've done that yeah. before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the other thing, too, like the artwork that goes into the cases, the covers yeah. and things like that. You know, um, they come out with some really, like now, like with it coming out, they're talking about the, the graphics and the artwork that's coming out for, um, there's like different ones, like Target's having a special, you know, limited release issue yeah. and like different places are having different artwork. And I think that's kind of cool. I mean, if you're a collector, you know, there's, all these opportunities to find different versions. I like that, you know. Yes, um, yeah. I like the steel I box, mean, the Blu-rays, mm -hmm. they're cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I've got, was, I believe, every type of uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind that you can find. And yeah. I love that, that I have those, those DVDs and Blade Runner, too. Like, I yeah. love having all my copies of Blade Runner. I mean, <laughs> I'm... I'm a sci-fi dark kid. I love that stuff. Love yeah, that. Cool. Love it. I have yeah, my original so. clamshell creep show here on my uh, shelf here next to me. It was the first VHS <laughs> video, uh, tape uh, my mom bought me when I was a kid. Oh, wow. Aww. That's my favorite. Aww. Isn't it? So, yeah. Go to Sad. I think, I think all my VHSs have gone, sadly. I don't think they're around anymore. Uh -huh. I think I've got half a dozen and all the rest have gone to the great plastic recycling unit in the sky. Yeah, I gave most of mine away a few years ago because I literally couldn't give them... Like, I tried to donate them to... Uh, I kept a few just like the creep show one because it means something to me. But I, I tried to even uh, donate them to, old, uh, to a nursing home and they wouldn't take them. They are like, we only take DVDs. And I was like, Jeez, there's like you know, uh, <laughs> it's the future. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I didn't want to throw them away. I was like, well, you know, it's like it would have cost more for the away. shipping to send them, and so I, I ended up giving them to a friend, and I think she well, ended up get, giving them to like a library or something. If you get enough of them, you could actually glue them all together and make an igloo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or a very small garage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to build, uh, that's what I'll build my yeah. Sherman tank out of. That's, yeah, there you go, you see. <laughs> yeah. I knew it all, it all yeah. comes around. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, how Next can you. Anytime you need a cameo or a tank, just call Neil. He'll have one built out of VHS. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Sounds good. Exactly. If you ever need a very strange looking uh, short guy, I'll, I'll be there. <laughs> but the. Um, <laughs> uh, how is the best way to follow uh, the gatehouse online and yourself online uh, well there's uh, we're on twitter uh, gatehouse is on twitter and I'm on facebook uh, and uh, and I have a website of course and that's probably it I've, I've been yet to work out instagram but I'm sure that'll come to me eventually mm -hmm. so just search your name you'll find it yeah I'm, I'm easy to find yeah and right now you're at Paul's house it. I'm at Paul's house yeah <laughs> he probably wants me to go. If anyone's in the neighborhood. Yeah. 
<laughs> so it's been uh, great to talk to you. And uh, honestly, yeah. I, I love the movie. And I, I know uh, Mama here did as well. Yeah, it was great. I really enjoyed it. And I have to say, if you go to our website, it, this is one that both both uh, Heather and I, uh, uh, Creepy Mama and I, really disagree with. Our uh, We have a someone who does a written re- uh, reviews, and uh, he liked it, but not as much as, as we did. So Yeah. Well, give me a suggestion. Yeah. I'll go around his house and have a word. I will. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gotta go to Kentucky. Kentucky. Exactly. <laughs> they good yes, bourbon good. there. I was just there not too long ago. Yeah, I was just thinking yeah. that. I think, what are they famous for? Chicken and whiskey. It's not a bad place. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I went there for a horror convention, and I basically just went on the bourbon trail the whole weekend. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Neil uh, drank all the bourbon. Like he tried to drink, or at least he tried to drink all the bourbon in that state. <laughs> he yeah. made a concentrated effort. It's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it. I got a free T-shirt out of it, saying well, that I could get the bourbon trail. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, yeah, so uh, well, I forgot what I was going to say, but oh, when uh, when your next movie comes out, uh, we great to have you back on. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, like I say, I'm editing. I'm editing Black Flowers uh, right now, and. Uh, uh, maybe it maybe it'll be finished like around about May, and then we'll start festivals and and sales and all that sort of stuff. All right, very cool. That's the plan. All right, guys, really great to speak to you. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank you for doing yeah, it. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, and uh, uh, we'll speak soon. Exactly. Yes, look forward to get... talking to you soon. This is Ashley Zhang from the Monster Squad, also known as the youngest Scream Queen, and you're listening without your head.